Welcome everyone to our uh, installment of Conversations on Europe uh, today. Um, and we have a full house here in Pittsburgh as well as remotely. So thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is JJ Spoon and I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for European Studies here at Pitt. Today's conversation is focused on the challenges to the European nation state with a focus on recent events in Spain and in Italy. Um, the conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center and supported by the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. Um, our co-sponsors uh, who are joining us remotely are Florida International University's Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Jean Monnet Center um, as well. And thank you to our staff here in the center for um, helping to organize the event. Um, and before we get started with today's event, just um, a uh, brief mention of our next conversation, which will be uh, titled uh, Wind, Water, and Sun, Clean Energy in Europe, which will be on January 24th. All right, so to get us started, um, in the past three years, uh, we have seen several uh, examples of the European nation state uh, being challenged by citizens and by political parties. In 2014, Prime Minister David Cameron agreed to Scottish First Minister and leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmond's request to hold a government sanctioned referendum on Scottish independence. On September 18th of that year, 85% of voters voted on the referendum, which was defeated 45% to 55%. Turning to this year and, and, and what's been going on in, in Europe, uh, Catalans have been trying to hold a referendum on the region's status, not only this year, but in, for the past few years. However, as we've seen, Prime Minister Rajoy and the Constitutional Court have not allowed it. Most recently, uh, an illegal referendum was held in October, something that we'll be talking more about today. The outcomes of this are still playing out as the Catalan president fled to Brussels after the vote. The Catalan parliament was dissolved and we will be having new elections in the coming weeks. Turning to Italy, the Eurosceptic and anti-immigrant Northern League or Lega Norda has been advocating for increased autonomy for the Northern regions and has even supported independence for what they refer to as Padania. In October, a non-binding referendum passed in Lombardy and Veneto uh, will to allow pass, which would allow for increased regional autonomy. The issue is likely to play a role in the upcoming general elections in Italy this spring. With this very brief overview, we now turn to our experts to better understand these recent events in Spain and Italy and the, and the broader context of the challenges to the European nation state. So we are joined today by three experts. Um, um, that I will uh, now say a few words about before we get started. Uh, first, uh, um, our first ex uh, expert joining us is Gianluca Passarelli. Dr. Passarelli is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science um, at the University of Rome. He holds an MA from the University of Bologna and a PhD from the University of Siena. His research focuses on presidents, political parties, electoral systems, and electoral behavior with an emphasis on Italy, the Northern League, and the Five Star Movement. Dr. Passarelli's research has been published in several journals and presses, including Party Politics, the Journal of Modern Italian Studies, Political Geography, Paul Grave, and Il Molino. His commentary on the Northern League has, has appeared in Il Molino as well. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, Sergei Pardos Prado. Dr. Uh, Dr. Pardos Prado is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and an official fellow at Merton College, University of Oxford. He holds a BA from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and an MA and PhD from the University, European University in Florence. His research focuses on political behavior, comparative politics, political economy, and immigration with an emphasis on Spain. Dr. Pardos Prado's research has been published in several journals, including the British Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, Political Behavior, Electoral Studies, and the Journal of Ethnic and Migration <coughs> Studies. His commentary on the current situation in Catalonia has appeared in the Washington Post monthly blog. And third, we are joined by Simon Tubo. Uh, Dr. Tubo is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham. He holds an MA from the University of Edinburgh, an MPhil from the University of Oxford, and a PhD from the University, European University uh, in Florence. His research focuses on territorial politics, federalism, nationalism, and party politics. Dr. Tubo's research has been published in several journals, including the European Journal of Political Research, Publius, the Journal of Federalism, the British Journal of Political Science, and Western <laughs> Journal of Politics. His commentary on the current situation in Catalonia has appeared in the Ellis London School of Economics European Politics and Policy blog. 
So with that, thank you all for joining us, um, and we can let's start this conversation. Um, so uh, to throw out a, a first question to all three of you, um, uh, before we get into some of the specifics of Spain and, and Italy, um, I thought we could start by talking a bit about uh, why we are seeing such a drive now for territorial reforms across Europe. Obviously, I started talking about Scotland, but Spain and Italy, etc. So what's changed and what, you know, what explains what's going on right now? So if anyone would like to, to jump in. I can start if you want. Okay, Gianluca. Uh, uh, just firstly, let me uh, one minute to thank you for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be, in a sense, back to Pittsburgh because I was a visiting professor uh, last March. So I thank you, Professor Spoon. Thank you, JJ, for this invitation and all the colleagues um, to share their uh, comments on this uh, common research interest. Uh, I think that uh, the new uh, wave, in a sense, of terrorism Sorry, technical. Okay. Um, while we're fix we're dealing with this, Simon or Mr. Jay, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, yes. So, well, once again, thanks, thanks very much for having us, guys. This is an exceptional event, and oh, maybe Gianluca is back. <laughs> okay, Gianluca. Sorry, let's go back to Gianluca. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, Gianluca, if you want to maybe go back and repeat what you said, sorry, we, we lost you for a minute there. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. From the since the beginning, or I don't know. Sure. Why don't yes? Why don't we do that? Since we had, got a little yeah, I was there. I was I was trying to uh, uh, argue that uh, I I think that uh, despite a, a few years ago, a few decades ago, uh, the drivers uh, and the triggers uh, and the characteristics of uh, the territorial uh, cleavages across Europe, uh, of course, with the differences between countries, uh, Spain, Italy, UK, uh, can be seen as based on political and partisan uh, cleavages mm? uh, that are politicized, politicized by partisan entrepreneurs vis-a-vis -vis the past, when there was this uh, uh, true, let's say, ethnical uh, uh, will to advance in a territorial reform. This is my first comment. The second difference that, that, that I can see is the fact, for example, in the case of, of Italy, is that we have, and uh, uh, JJ I will be back uh, on this uh, specific case uh, talking about the, the Northern League, is that the, the territory is not the subnational territory. It's not anymore, it's not, it's not only the, sub the subnational territory. Now the territory is the nation. So now for, this, for the nationalist party, that the territory is the whole country. So this is uh, strongly related to the, the immigration policy. So we have, I, I will use this uh, metaphor if I can, is that in the past, uh, we had an internal enemy that was the state. Now we have an external enemy that is the immigrants coming from abroad. This is uh, uh, especially uh, uh, true and evident in the Italian case, but uh, with some uh, differences, we can see even paradoxically, even with the case of uh, of Catalonia. But of course, there is the colleague that is much more um, skillful than I am. So I can see these two aspects that are uh, going to be differentiating 
uh, despite the past in terms of uh, making a new cleavage in terms of the territory. Thank you. Simon, you want to? Yes, okay. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to, to participate in, in your seminar. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the, the format of this. It's, it's very interesting to be able to participate remotely. Um, so I just have uh, three points I'd like to make. Um, the first is to just perhaps bear in mind that <clears throat> this, the most uh, recent uh, installment of a uh, territorial reform or attempted territorial reform and, and comes uh, really uh, on, on behind a, a string uh, of previous reforms that have characterized uh, politics and, and constitutional politics in particular in, in both countries uh, since uh, at least the, the, the mid-1990s. Um, and I think that in particular, the, the, the latest, let's say, um, period of mobilization um, has uh, been in part informed and motivated by uh, the failures uh, of previous reforms. Uh, in the case of Italy, there was an attempt at uh, reforming the, the system of fiscal federalism <laughs> in the period between 2008 and 2011, which resulted in, in failure. The Lega was in government with uh, the center-right uh, coalition, but really failed to, to achieve its objectives in terms of uh, obtaining greater taxation autonomy, uh, in part because of the fragmentation uh, within the center-right uh, coalition, in part because of the divisions uh, and the conflict with, with the uh, Alianza Nazionale. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, Spain, uh, <clears throat> this uh, current period is, is partly in response to the series of reforms that took place uh, in the period between 2004 and 2006, when there was a generalized uh, revision of uh, several statutes of autonomy uh, for some of the autonomous communities in Spain. And in the case of Catalonia, they, they successfully obtained a reform of their statutes of autonomy, but uh, some of the substance of that reform was later uh, diluted by uh, a, a ruling of the um, uh, of, of a uh, Spanish uh, court, which uh, eliminated some of the more important uh, symbolic um, elements to the statute of autonomy, in particular the recognition of Catalonia as a, as a distinct nation. Uh, there, there was also some differences between the uh, statute that was eventually uh, approved uh, by the central uh, parliament and, and by referendum and the statute uh, uh, proposition for reform that had been presented by the Catalan parliament in, in 2003. So this, this is partly being informed by uh, objectives that hadn't been uh, fulfilled in previous rounds of, of reform. Uh, behind all of that, I think it's important to mention the uh, uh, economic uh, crisis, which uh, hit both countries uh, very, very uh, hard in, from about 2010, uh, and I think in the case of Catalonia revealed uh, the uh, difficulties in which the, the, the region had found itself. It uh, had a very high level of deficit, a very high level of debt, uh, and I think it uh, reminded both the Catalan government and its citizens that um, they were operating in a, uh, in, in a system which maybe uh, w w was at least perceived as discriminatory uh, towards towards the region. Uh, there may be something similar going on going on in Italy um, with 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 the crisis uh, there. Uh, and then finally, I, I think it's important just to bear in mind that there's a kind of multi-level uh, party politics uh, dynamic going on. Insofar as we have two very different uh, coalitions uh, of forces in in regional government and in central government. Uh, so in Spain, there's been a uh, centre-right government uh, in, in uh, central office um, since 2011. And in Catalonia, there's been a, a build-up of, um, of the nationalist uh, coalition uh, since about uh, 2010. Um, whereas in Italy, we find that the Lega Nord is uh, no longer in, in central government since about 2011. Uh, but has been able to use uh, regional elections to enter office there and is currently in government in Lombardy and in Veneto. 
and is using that platform as as one in which to project its its demands against the a government in the central government which was either technocratic or, or of a center left persuasion so there's a kind of part the uh, patterns of government and opposition are that we see in both countries are also patterns of uh, opposition between uh, party, parties and coalitions, but also between the central and regional governments. So that's another kind of uh, sort of more short term uh, aspect that may underpin the, the conflict. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> well, hi, hi again. Uh, thanks very much uh, for having us. This is uh, this is a great format, as, uh, as Simon was saying. Um, I guess I will very much agree with some of the issues that uh, Gianluca and Simon have been highlighting. They are highlighting <coughs> top-down uh, partisan dynamics and the failure of constitutional arrangements and many contextual and short-term factors. I guess just to complement sort of like this, this general explanation, um, basically, I will just highlight perhaps more this, some of the structural factors, some of the bottom up factors, as you would, as you would say. And I think that, you know, the first point in that regard uh, would be that I think it's not by chance that we see these kind of like new salience of territorial demands um, in, in, in a period in which globalization is further away than ever, right? So I think that is, these two things are not by chance. So we are in a world that is more and more open, where it's uh, easier and easier to travel around, to trade internationally, and therefore the needs uh, or the role of the national state get, gets a tiny bit less prominent, right? So in this more global world where, you know, different units sort of like start to trade with each other, sort of like parallelly to the national state or beyond the national state, that generates a different distributions of winners and losers. So suddenly there's sub-national, let's say, territories that suddenly, you know, attract more foreign investment, more people from abroad, tourism are just a little bit more attractive. Uh, and therefore this changes a little bit the interest of that region. And if one has a little bit already a pre-existing center periphery conflict that makes it more salient and the national state becomes is perceived as a bit more of a of a of a straight jacket let's say right it's, it's perceived as less costly to just go solo and travel with the world travel in the european sort of like trade with the european union in the single market and therefore the national market as such becomes less less of a need and therefore this is perhaps one of the you know, important differences between the, the Catalan, uh, perhaps, case and, 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 and perhaps the Italian case, as, as, as Gianluca was, was perhaps explaining very well. So this retrenchment towards territorial identities and territorial power is sometimes driven by the winners of globalization, at least in the Catalan case. It's precisely a bit of a middle class, sort of rich region uh, pushing forward uh, which is not technically, you know, it's not a bit of an anti-immigrant movement at all. And the same, I think, uh, applies to the, the Scottish case. So it's, you know, there, there's two different sort of like push factors here. No, the losers of globalization perceiving economic threats or cultural threats to the openness of the world want to retrench towards the good old national state. But some of the winners of uh, globalization actually are trying to depart from the old national state and create one of their own. And then when one looks at the social demographics and attitudinal profile of, you know, secessionist voters, at least in Catalonia, and to some extent, at least in terms of parties and narrative in Scotland, they are actually, they sound, uh, and at least on paper, much more pro-refugees uh, and more pro-immigration than others. So long story short, just the first point, I think that globalization lowers the cost of secession, generates a new territorial or highlights the new territorial distribution of winners and losers, and the winners have more incentives to go solo, especially if the, they perceive, rightfully or wrongly, that the state is not doing a good job or is economically underperforming. And therefore, you know, the cost of secession uh, uh, you know, it gets minimized, so to speak. 
that's really interesting. So I want to kind of follow up on that before we, I, I, I was going to move right into some of the specifics, but um, Sergey, something you just said um, made me um, think a lot about and what I wanted to ask you and anyone and else that wants to, to join in on the conversation um, is, you know, so what's the role of the European Union in all of this, right? So I think this is a really interesting perspective to think about this in terms of globalization and how, Sergey, as you just said, globalization lowers the cost of succession in some ways. So how do we think about the European Union as either sort of a you know pulling um, uh, towards secession or a push towards you know it, we can think about it in terms of a push or a pull. So I wonder what your, your thoughts are on that, and then others right. that might want to jump in. Well, no, I think I think that's that's actually a great question. Um, so basically, I think that the European Union symbolizes a little bit this sort of like global kind of like single market or global trading sort of that our world is is facing and therefore uh, at least in the catalan narrative this was this was very obvious like well we can just now ignore the spanish state because you know the european union will accept us and therefore we can just we are we are rich overperforming economically we attract foreign investment we can do better and therefore the the belonging let's say to the european union at least in this narrative lowers the cost uh, once again, of of sticking to the to the national market and the national state, which is increasingly uh, increasingly perceived as obsolete. Then there's a second related argument, which is in terms of like political accountability. Um, let's say whenever you know markets go global, and whenever you know the single market goes European and not only French or Belgian or or Spanish anymore, the level of regulation also moves upwards right so uh you know the the the, the locus the the center of power is moving upwards and a little bit away from the national state in those regions where you have a bit of a pre-existing center periphery or territorial conflict this you know uh losing this center of political accountability this losing control becomes more prominent than ever so i think there's this like push factor to just sort of like trying to recover that sort of like control, this taking back control, this frame that has been that has been so prominent uh, prominent in different political narratives these days, is very effective. Whenever you know there is a region that feels that the state that is not properly represented by the national state uh, as such. Having said that, I think the European Union is actually uh, a club of states. So while it gives more incentives to these territorial movements to try to seek maybe independence because they think they're going to do better, at the same time, we actually have seen the reaction of the European Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Catalan conflict. Uh, the European Commission is a top-down, non-popularly elected sort of like uh, political body, and therefore their incentives to deviate from whatever the national states are saying are very low. So in a way, the role becomes a bit ambiguous. <laughs> if, uh, Simon, do you want to yeah, uh, in terms of the European Union, it, for example, in the case of Italy, or in the case of the Northern League, is is very clear uh, the shift uh, between the case uh, of European Union of Europe in general as a big opportunity. At the beginning, the Northern League was keen to the European Union, was uh, uh, pushing for a, a, an implementation of this uh, uh, project. Why? Because it was the Europe of the regions, as uh, Sergi was saying, the, the union of different regions without any supranational governance. So the the, uh, the 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 turnout was when Italy entered to the uh, euro system, the euro uh, currency system. So in, two, in, in the late 90s, at the beginning of the 2000, uh, at that point, the Europe became to to be perceived as uh, the enemy. Uh, the world of the constraints, the world of the limits to the small farms, to the identities. So Europe as Europe of technocrats, Europe of, of the grey bureaucrats of Brussels, 
which are trying to uh, normalize people's identities, uh, cultural uh, um, differences, uh, um, food uh, peculiarities, and so forth and so on. In that case, um, uh, Europe became the trigger of the new revendication of uh, territorial uh, identities. So it is uh, between the the end of 90s, the beginning of 2000 and 2001. So 9/11 represent the 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 really U turn on the policy of the Northern League vis-à-vis -vis Europe, because uh, before. Northern League was a kind of almost atheist uh, party. Then after 9-11, it became the party claiming to defend the so-called Simon, Hi. did you want to add anything? Sorry, we're having a bit of, <laughs> did you want to add uh, anything about the discussion? Yeah, um, I, I think it's an interesting point and I, I, I agree with, with what's been mentioned before. I think that the EU is, a, um, as a, in particular, the single market is, is the most advanced form of economic globalization that exists. Uh, in the world, and so it it, um, it kind of um, mid diminishes the costs of of secession for for regions like Cat Catalonia, um, and I think that in that way the there's been a kind of indirect uh, push uh, for some of these regions with uh, distinct identities. So the the EU process of uh, market integration has has provided that uh, incentive. Uh, that being said, I I also agree that. Uh, if we look at more of a kind of direct influence, if we look at the role of the institutions and the member states, uh, there it looks less evident. I think there's probably more of a constraint uh, on, on regions who uh, may wish to uh, become independent. Uh, and this has been enshrined in what's been called the Prodi Doctrine, which is that, uh, which, which really is, has, has created this disincentive for, for regions to uh, leave their states because it means that there's a period of time between when they, uh, uh, after which they, they leave their state that they have to uh, wait and, and reapply for membership of the, of the European Union, that there's no automatic membership of the European Union should you choose to leave your state. And that's created an important disincentive uh, because it means that uh, regions like Catalonia or Scotland are in a period of, of limbo for, for some years. Presumably, it's a relatively quick process of reaccession uh, since they've already complied with all of the uh, criteria. Uh, but, but that nevertheless creates an important disincentive. Uh, the EU is also a club uh, of, of states. Uh, the constitutional treaties are founded on the sovereignty uh, of the member states. It is the member states who have to ratify treaty reform, who have to ratify uh, the accession of, of uh, new members and who retain uh, this uh, legal doctrine of, of competence, competence, that is the competence to change the range uh, of um, activities that the EU uh, is involved in. Uh, that being said, um, I think that there's a number of ways in which the EU is also <coughs> slowly at least providing some of the ideas and some of the concepts which may uh, facilitate um, independence for, for certain regions. One of those is the idea of uh, shared sovereignty, so that while the member states are um, sovereign uh, in their ability to uh, change the architecture of the European Union, the European institutions themselves have acquired competences uh, 
partly through the just the normal everyday legislative process in the European Union. This has been called competence uh, accretion. Uh, so they tend to legislate in areas which are perhaps not immediately within their, their purview. Um, another way in which sovereignty is shared is that um, sometimes uh, treaty reforms have to be um, approved by popular referendum so that the sovereignty doesn't necessarily lie with, with the, the member state governments, but rather with the populations. And we're also seeing the important uh, involvement of regions in uh, some uh, aspects of uh, European uh, policy making and uh, treaty reform. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Belgian uh, regions, uh, the Flemish and the Walloon regions uh, have representation uh, in the Council of Ministers in some of the uh, areas which are within their uh, competences, for example, agriculture. Uh, and we also saw, for example, that Wallonia was uh, an important uh, obstacle to the ratification of the free trade agreement with Canada uh, because uh, it involved certain uh, policy areas in which the Walloon region has competences and, and, and it could have vetoed uh, the entire trade agreement. Um, so, um, so we, we're seeing, you know, the, the, the importance, at least the increasing visibility of uh, regions in some of these areas. Uh, we're accepting the idea that uh, sovereignty is, is, a, is, a, is shared rather than, rather than concentrated at the level of the member states. And, and, and I think that uh, there's a kind of, I, I, I think that that will in the long run um, create, let's say, a, an environment which facilitates uh, the, the, the independence uh, of certain regions. So uh, thank you. I think that really provides us with a sense of sort of how complicated this is, that it's not necessarily um, as are most things, I suppose, but right, that this is, is not clearly, um, uh, you know, sort of bottom up or top down or a push or a pull, right? Whereas, you know, the institutions on the one hand may be making this, you know, uh, harder as many of the institutions like the commission is as was mentioned are focused on the nation states themselves but that as simon also just mentioned we're starting to see that we are seeing shared sovereignty in certain areas as well and so we aren't getting a necessarily a clear picture even from the institutional perspective and then of course we have sort of the the bottom-up perspective or the voters perspective which we'll get more into more in a minute which is that that the this idea that um that the EU, because of this idea perhaps of shared sovereignty and because of things like the Europe of the regions and because of things that are happening at the sub below the nation state level, that it does lower the cost, for example, of for example uh, of for example supporting secession and things like that. So I think we're getting a very um, nuanced picture of, of, of the situation and sort of where um, we're getting uh, various pushes and pulls for both support for um, independence or um, increased autonomy um, and also a pushback as well. Um, so I wanna move on now and, and we can keep thinking about these things, but I wanna move on and spend some time specifically talking about Spain and, and, and Italy as well and getting into some of the, the specifics of, of what's going on and, and, and uh, especially in the case of Catalonia, um, things have uh, changed and, and even as of yesterday. So um, there's, there's a constantly evolving um, uh, situation. So um, if whoever wants to jump in um, on this, to maybe give us, um, maybe Simon or, or Sergi, to give us um, a bit of the, the, the background and sort of how we got to the referendum in October, what the outcome was, how the government has responded, um, and kind of give us just a sense of, of where we, how we got to where we are now. Um, and then we can start talking about uh, what comes next, I suppose. So whoever would like to, to start that. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> okay, Sergio, go ahead. Thanks. I think that Simon was already highlighting a couple of important points when he will, he, he perhaps will elaborate more on it later in terms of like the, the, the failed constitutional reform that uh, basically Catalan suggested in the, in the early uh, mid 2000s and that was subsequently watered down in the Spanish parliament and uh, later on banned in its core principles by the constitutional court in a still controversial sentence that it's sometimes seen as a bit the trigger of the whole thing in 2010. So I guess this is a very important sort of first factor, a, a bit of a sense of a political grievance uh, 
um, whereby sort of like Catalan elites uh, at the very end of 2005 voted by 89% of the of, of parliamentary support. So 89% of uh, of MPs in the Catalan Parliament voted in favor of this new statute and autonomy, they would call it, which was a bit of a federal rearrangement of the relationship between Catalonia and Spain. And this was, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, subsequently uh, watered down and, and ultimately banned, at least in two core principles, not only symbolic, as in terms of like Catalonia not being recognized as a nation, but also perhaps more substantially in terms of, you know, fiscal federalism, right? So that statute contemplated the possibility of Catalonia being the ultimate responsible of collecting taxes, right? So having full autonomy in terms of tax revenue, which is something that already exists in the Basque country and also in Navarra uh, these days, right? So it was just like, hey, those guys have it, why not us kind of argument. Then perhaps uh, the second more contextual argument um, or reason why, you know, we are in the situation where we are has been the spectacular economic crisis that, that, that Spain went through and also some corruption scandals, right? So from 2009, 2010 onwards, Spain went through a, a particularly acute economic and political crisis that exacerbated some of these sort of like factors that I guess we were uh, we were talking about before. No? Suddenly it's like we are an overperforming region, we are in this hopeless state, the costs of secession are lower now because of all these single market, Euro, European Union, etc. Why, why, why don't we go for it kind of like argument, no? If I could just like put it in very simple terms. And, uh, and then the third reason, which is perhaps a bit more bottom up, more structural, and sometimes people talk a bit less about it. I think there has been over the late 1990s and, you know, onwards, a bit of a generational replacement um which is actually very important so basically generations of voters that were a bit younger born and exclu exclusively socialized in democracy less fearful of tanks and military juntas and coup d'etats you know they also schools in catalan uh basically they associated the whole catalan narrative with something that was not dangerous also, uh, and, and potentially even like an okay ideology, right? Um, very importantly, in the very beginning of the 2000s, the canonical pro-independence party, Esquerra Republicana de Catalunya, center-left sort of like pro-independence party, had the chance to form a coalition with the center-right nationalists and form a nationalistic Catalan bloc, or to, have a co or, or to build a coalition with the socialist party and the new left, going more for a left-wing kind of coalition and they decided to go for the latter so they present the, the pro-independence party presented itself in front of these new generations of voters as a party that had a more programmatic kind of like agenda they were like look we're not only the crazy pro-independence guys we know that there's no mood for that we are also a center-left sort of like progressive party or whatever, right? And we're ready to team up with other people who do not agree with us with these independence things. So they normalized secessionism and secessionism went mainstream, I think, for those younger generation of voters. And when you do the breakdown in terms of age and generation and support for independence nowadays, this generational divide is very, very clear. Um, so I think that I was wondering what my colleagues think and I wouldn't like to say anything wrong, but something potentially similar happened in the Scottish case, with the Scottish National Party truly becoming a bit more mainstream uh, at the expense of Labour in particular. So secessionism was a bit of a progressive um, new ideology, a bit of a sort of mechanism for change. Let's do a better country. Let's make it more progressive, more equal, better via sort of like secessionism. And this became sort of like a bit of an attractive narrative for center-left young voters who, you know, were a bit more detached from classical social democratic sort of um, working class kind of like labor parties that belonged a little bit more to the industrial era and, you know, were more sort of like attractive for their parents, so to speak. I think that's a really interesting um, point about generational replacement. Um, 
um, and something that I don't think um, we hear much about, um, but I think that especially in the case of Spain, thinking about a, new, a generation that is used to democracy and used to this ability to sort of identify as, as, Catal as Catalans, for example, and that this has now become part of the normal part of politics. Um, and I think we saw that um, in Scotland as well um, with devolution happening in the late 1990s. And so you had a whole generation of young Scots that were used to sort of that narrative. And this was then sort of perhaps the next step to that. So um, I think that, that's an important part of, part of the story. Um, Simon or John Luca, if we're sort of staying on, on Spain for a minute, do you want to add any anything um, to, to what Sergi has told us? Yeah, if, if I may just just add a few things, I think those are all really interesting points, and and I'd I'd um, yeah I I'd like to so I'd like to personally know more about the influence of um, the actual institutions of regional government on public attitudes. So, do we see um, more, uh, let's say, Catalanist or Catalan identifiers uh, among uh, younger people, but um, in particular, those who are uh, exposed to, let's say, Catalan uh, public uh, media, those who go to uh, Catalan public schools, and, and those who are effectively influenced by um, those, those policy areas which are within the control of the Catalan government. So we, we can think of, of the, 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 the Catalan government itself having an important role since at least you know, the mid-1980s in shaping Catalan society and, and shaping Catalan, Catalan identity. So there, there may be something there about not, not just public attitudes, but the way in which public attitudes change in response to the unfolding uh, of, a, of a decentralizing state as, as was occurring uh, in Spain. Um, I'd just like to add maybe one aspect which I think is important. Uh, this is all consistent with what was uh, mentioned by Sergi, which is I think that there's also an important uh, role played by the central government. Uh, and uh, in particular, the fact that there was a center-right, conservative, nation Spanish nationalist uh, government uh, in central office um, did, I think, contributed a lot to uh, the perceptions in Catalonia, both public perceptions and the perceptions of the political elites, that somehow the normal uh, bargaining territorial brokerage style of politics, which they and, uh, were accustomed to and which Catalonia did very well, uh, was no longer working. Uh, they had made a number of claims. They, they had played through the rules of the game when they had reformed the statute of autonomy and that um, they felt uh, uh, gave them a short shrift. They didn't uh, obtain what they were hoping for, in particular in terms of symbolic recognition and in terms of, of uh, fiscal arrangements. Um, and when they issued these demands anew, uh, it fell on deaf ears because the, the conservatives in, in the Spanish central government were unwilling uh, to accommodate these demands. And I think that that played an important role in uh, increasing the, the um, public support for uh, Catalan uh, independence. And I, I think that if we look at the, the, the evolution of events from about 2012 onwards, there was a uh, increasing uh, demand for a uh, what was called the right to decide. And so um, what, what we see uh, in, in Catalonia is not just a demand for independence, uh, which I don't think held the majority for uh, at least until recently, but really th there was a demand for holding a referendum. And I think that that was very important. I think that that was possibly more important than the wish for independence itself. Uh, but this was constantly uh, rejected by the Spanish central government and by Spanish uh, central uh, judicial institutions uh, for you know legal reasons. Uh, and we can talk about you know how good those reasons were or whether or not they should have maybe been, uh, let's say, countervailed by political uh, reasoning, uh, but 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 yeah, I think that I think that it's important to bear in mind that this this had an important uh, influence, and obviously behind all of that is the continuing and perhaps increasing appeal of of Spanish nationalism, which we also see uh, increasingly manifested uh, in 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 the rest of Spain, people who are supporting. 
a you know strong single Spanish state, and and in in many cases also have a a kind of uh, vision of Spain which is uh, perhaps more culturally uh, homogenous than and than is actually uh, the fact. Um, and I'd just like to finish by saying that I think that this conflict between the Catalan region and, and the Spanish central government, the, the Catalan regional government and the Spanish central government, has completely transformed uh, the Catalan party system. In the past, you used to have a, let's say, left-wing coalition, the Socialists, Esquerra Republicana, and in the past, you used to have a right-wing nationalist well, also a coalition of, of liberals and, and Christian Democrats, and they were more or less moderate in their nationalist aspirations. And this issue of the uh, referendum, of the right to decide, completely transformed the party system in, in which now the main division was between the parties that supported the referendum and those that didn't. And so what we see in that case is a, a, a kind of unification of the former nationalist uh, political parties, Esquerra Republicana and uh, Convergencia Democratica de Catalunya. So the center-right nationalist party split into two, and Convergencia Democratica joined Esquerra Republicana into a single coalition in favor of uh, the referendum. And the remaining part of uh, Convergencia Union, which is the Christian Democrats, they remained uh, opposed to, to, to the referendum and alongside all of the other, uh, let's say, uh, political forces in Spain, the socialists uh, and Ciudadanos. So, so the confrontation with the Spanish central government, in my view, transformed the nature of uh, party politics in, in the Catalan region. And, and that's an important dynamic uh, for explaining what's going on there at the moment. So let's... Um... We could, of course, keep talking about this for, for a very long time, but we um, I want to make sure we spend some time talking about Italy, and then we'll get back to sort of what perhaps some of the solutions are. So, Gianluca, do you want to um, jump in and, and, and sort of pick up on this discussion of, of party politics, especially as it relates to the Northern League and how uh, the Northern League has been uh, you know, pushing for autonomy, where we are now, um, and, and, and things like that? Thank you, JJ. <clears throat> Uh, as uh, Robert Putnam understood uh, since the 70s, uh, you can understand the Italian case and uh, the Italian policy of territorial uh, reform without considering regions as uh, political actors. The most important political actor in terms of territory is the comune are the cities, small or big that can be. And in fact, the founder and the charismatic leader of the Northern League, Umberto Bossi, quickly, although at the beginning emphasized and stressed the role of the North vis-a-vis uh, -vis South divide, the North vis-a-vis -vis South cleavage, so all the bad words against Southern people, he understood that there was not any common language, dialect, any common will, any common identity to stress to the point of the independence. So he, uh, as he was a charismatic leader, because in those parties, as a JJ knows very well, better than I, I do, at least, that the leadership, it is very important, this kind of parties, because sometimes they are personal parties. Hmm? So he was able to uh, uh, lead the party to a big U-turn. So the, 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 the idea was to have an opposition kind of populist party, hmm? regional attitudes, regional in terms of not the regions as institutions, but the regional in terms of subnational area against the nation, the nation, against the state. But this, uh, as uh, 
the colleague was saying, as uh, Simon was saying before, uh, was the Liga Nord once in the government was not able, for many reasons that I will not uh, repeat here, was not able to uh, achieve the goals of the independency of, or more autonomy. So in the, in the late, uh, mid to late uh, 2000, the Liga Nord performed very bad in terms of uh, uh, electoral results. So now, this is, uh, JJ, this is the key point that I would uh, emphasize in my uh, uh, modest contribution to this uh, interesting uh, debate, is that the Lega Nord is, I mean, the argument of territory is uh, on the backstage, is something that is uh, refrained to, uh, uh, to excite the, the grassroots in the meeting, uh, in, the, in the party meetings, but the official uh, program is a national party. Uh, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Dario Torto, and I wrote this small book, unfortunately is in Italian, it's called the Lega in Padania, it, it was in 2012. They start to nationalize the party in terms of issues, in terms of policies, they do emphasize uh, the immigration as the big enemy of the Italians. So before it was Northern versus Southern people, Italian people. Now is Italians first. Hmm? I, know, I know you are uh, familiar with, with this uh, uh, slogan. <laughs> So, but we, we, no comment. <laughs> uh, we, we created it. Uh, I mean, Italians first, then all mm -hmm. others. So, so the territory from a small area becomes the Italy, the Italy, the Italian territory. That's why there is a, a, simili a similarity between the uh, um, Northern League and the French uh, National Front, hmm? the Front, the, the Front National, and finally, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the Northern League is joining again the uh, center right, uh, the center right coalition, uh, but we don't we don't know yet. Because Northern League has not yet performed in the southern regions, so I I will not make any electoral forecast. But I have some doubts uh, about the Northern League uh, ability to grasp votes in the south. They they drop north from the from the label of the party, so it's called uh, Lega. Uh, with the name of the leader, which is Salvini, but uh, the territory is not the, the matter. And as is Simon, Simon was saying, it's, in, it's important to conjugate this, this aspect with the fact that the Northern League is, uh, as the governors, let's say, to use a more uh, familiar uh, um, term, as the governor of the two most important regions in terms of um, GDP, let's say. So the region of Milan and the region of uh, Venice. So they are very uh, important. And uh, as uh, JJ was mentioning uh, at the beginning, there were two local referendum to uh, call for uh, more autonomy, but they, those uh, referendum uh, don't have any legal um, uh, consequences because the, the, the local uh, government must negotiate with the national government. And, and I'm uh, finished my last uh, argument. The regional government are not uh, asking for independency because that was uh, declared as a and constitutional in the referendum. So they are just negotiating for more uh, autonomy in terms of 
fiscal policy is important and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Simon, did you want to add? No, I, I don't. I don't have anything okay. to add to the time case. Thanks. Okay, sorry, I didn't know if you were if you were signaling. All right. Okay. Um, well, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so I want to uh, take take a break uh, for a moment and give a chance to um, our audience here and our audiences in, in Florida and in Illinois, which we have very large audiences, which is wonderful. Um, if there are any questions, as, as well as those that may be joining us remotely, um, if there are any questions um, that you would like answered. Um, I, I would appreciate if the panels would address the question of what you might call the uses or non-uses of the past. Now, indications point in two different directions. Simon rightly considered that the single market was an extraordinary achievement, but so is the EU, especially historically. If you consider Europe's bloody past, it's an extraordinary achievement to have been accomplished, and now it seems to have been taken for granted by a younger generation, willing to cast it aside for some uncertain goals without recognizing that national purposes, you might say, led to disaster in the past. By the same token, I was struck when I was in Catalonia recently, how quickly the past came up in the Spanish context, where people were quickly branded as Francoids or anti francos which each of them claimed, of course. Um, and those who opposed secession were quickly branded as being, as being pro-Franco. Um, maybe that's just the Spanish context. And I'm wondering if, how this affects the younger generation as we move towards a question of voters' preference. Mm -hmm. Who would like to? Sergi, do you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a it's a very good question. Good questions usually have bad answers, but I'll I'll try to I'll try to uh, I'll try to do my best. So I think that um, at least the territorial demand or the nationalistic uh, sort of like Catalan demand has been uh, very explicitly pro-European at least up until now. So in in a way, um, I haven't I haven't seen uh, up until now a trade-off between very much valuing. Uh, the European Union as a political and economic sort of like major advancement and the possibility of having a, an independent Catalonia within the European Union. So that nationalistic framing, uh, quite similar again with the Scottish one, hasn't, hasn't put the European Union and the territorial nationalistic demand as a zero-sum game. If anything, the opposite. The European Union has always had a very, very positive level of uh, sort of like uh, uh, appreciation amongst uh, exclusively independence uh, voters because they would see the European Union as a as a clear exit option uh, that would uh, once again lower the cost uh, uh, of secession and eventually render the national market and the national institutional framework, meaning the Spanish uh, national framework, as, as perhaps less needed, right? Things might have changed perhaps a little, and it's a bit early to say, with the very, very recent events when the European Union, or in this case, the European Commission, has in, inequivocally uh, sort of backed up the, the actions of, of, uh, of uh, Rajoy and his government in, in, in what could be described as a bit of a hard line Sort of like, sort of like reaction to the illegal referendum on the first of October, basically uh, using uh, police intervention uh, and also, uh, in this case, using the law, let's say, to jail elected uh, officials and and so on and so forth. So perhaps it is true that now the scenario might have changed, but this is a very, very uh, recent scenario. In fact, I remember seeing a very serious experimental evidence showing that whenever you would prime nationalistic Catalan voters on the possibility of an independent Catalonia outside the European Union, uh, the support support for independence would, would massively drop, right? So in a way, I think that this is the, the, the clearest bargaining chip uh, uh, for the unionist or pro-Spanish union constitutionalist narrative, no? Like it's very cold out there, guys, outside the European Union. And this is and this is uh, and this is gonna be something that indeed is going to be very harmful for the Catalan for the Catalan narrative. Then the Franco parallelism, I, I, I share 
uh, I understand why this comes across as very puzzling. I think that sometimes these comparisons with fascist and authoritarian pasts uh, flow a little bit too easily. They are I incredibly hurtful on the other side, right? Because the other side does not feel, nobody likes to be called a fascist and therefore sometimes these comparisons are not quite accurate uh, conceptually. But I think that what these comparisons kind of like reveal behind the curtains is a bit of a clash between two narratives, right? The, the Catalan or pro-secession narrative is a, strictly speaking, a liberal democracy narrative. They are like, look, this is, democracy is a bottom-up process. Laws are a reflection of the people's will. And going back to what Simon was saying about the right to decide, uh, you know, if we want to change the laws, no matter what we voted 40 decades ago after, so, uh, sorry, four decades ago after the dictatorship, we have the right to redefine it. So if the people want, we can change the constitutional framework. Then this narrative clashes with a more sort of uh, constitutional democracy kind of like narrative, which is fundamentally very different, which is like, look guys, the state, the existence of the state goes beyond volatile sort of like fluctuations in public opinion. This is what we agreed upon after the dictatorship. Here we have the 1978 constitution. Any attempt to break it, uh, you know, is not acceptable. And then, of course, sometimes this is called as anti-liberal or authoritarian, even if it's just a different conception, a bit of a more Germanic, Kelsenian, vertical idea. And the constitution is what informs the rest of the legal apparatus, right? So I think that those comparisons are indeed sometimes they're unfortunate. They come with a lot of political damage, but they indeed reflect two different conceptions of democracy, arguably one of them a bit more liberal than the other. Commander John Luca, do you, Simon, do you want to, or John? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. I, I don't, I don't, I again, I wholeheartedly uh, share what uh, Sergi has been saying. I think that what's interesting isn't just what, uh, what uses are made of the past, but what aspect of the past is actually usable. And I think that that's also uh, a, an interesting way of looking at it. I think that the, the, the past history uh, has uh, played a role in primarily in, in shaping uh, narratives uh, on the two sides of, of the debate. And uh, I, th I think that it's, a, it's an important element of, of, of the discourse, both on the kind of Catalan nationalists, but also uh, on the side of the Spanish central government. If we look at uh, on the Spanish, on the sorry, the Catalan uh, nationalists, uh, they did, they do, and they they have and continue to appeal to historical <laughs> events uh, to legitimize their enterprise, and it ha and and a lot of it is is very uh, highly uh, emotionally charged. So the National Day in Catalonia is the 11th of September. Uh, which coincides with uh, a day in which uh, Catalonia was, was defeated uh, in, during the Spanish Wars of, of Succession, the Carlist Wars in 1714. Uh, Catalonia was defeated by, by the, the Bourbon dynasty and a lot of the uh, Catalan uh, institutions of, of self-government, their uh, legal codes, their tax code, uh, their representative assemblies were suspended. And, and this represents a kind of historical uh, defeat for Catalonia in uh, the beginning of a process of, of centralization of authority uh, in, in, in the Spanish state. And, and that, that day is, is, is an important day on, in the calendar and was the day at which uh, a lot of the uh, social movements, uh, the nationalist social movements, organized uh, large-scale demonstrations uh, in Barcelona. And this is where millions of people poured into the streets waving the, the Catalan, the flag of the, the independent Catalan Republic. Uh, so what, what we see is that the, the past comes into play in shaping discourse and in shaping uh, uh, emotions. Um, and I think that we, we saw that again with, with the kind of referrals to Francoism uh, when, when the Spanish central government uh, prevented uh, the, the uh, referendum from taking place and, and uh, made use of, of force uh, in order to do so. It was 
very quick, to, the, the, the Catalan uh, nationalist narrative was very quick to demonstrate that this was, you know, the oppressive authoritarian uh, state, uh, which had really never disappeared. Um, but we see that also on, on the other side, the side of the Spanish central government, as Sergi says, in which there's been a really important emphasis on the importance of the existing Spanish constitution, the one that had been uh, elaborated and ratified in 1978. And for a lot of the uh, Spanish conservatives, uh, but also uh, the socialists to a lesser degree, this achievement is uh, underpins the success of contemporary uh, Spanish democracy. And so that historical episode is one in which uh, it's, it's sort of put on a pedestal, if you like. And the, the result of that uh, episode is something that cannot be touched. Uh, and it's so it's been sort of given this sort of, uh, kind of religious uh, kind of status, you know, it's, it's, it's sacrosanct and, and it, it can't be touched because it underpins the success of Spanish democracy. And so there, you, you find that both sides will go to the past and choose those particular episodes that happen to, you know, be, be consistent with, with their existing uh, narratives. And, and a lot of it is what underpins, uh, I think, the polarization that we're seeing uh, on, on the two sides, uh, because both of them, of course, uh, do not refer to those, to those episodes of the past in which, uh, you know, there, there would have been uh, compromise and consensus uh, between nationalist forces in, in Catalonia and, and, and the forces representing the, the central Spanish state. And there are, there are episodes, uh, I mean, the, the constitution is obviously of 1978 is, is one of them, uh, but there have also been uh, episodes of negotiation since then, uh, which, which, have, uh, which have received the, the support of, of all of the uh, parties involved in those negotiations, as well as, as, as uh, public support. So I think that um, yeah, the uses of the past are there in, in, the, in, the, in the discourses, in the narratives, uh, but it's, it's those parts of the past which happen to be usable, uh, which seem to be uh, referred to. Thank you. Um, I want to give others a chance to ask questions, if there are any here or remotely. I wanted to ask a, a broader question about the EU future, in the sense that the EU, which was based on the nation state and on those nation states' willingness to give up some degree of control over its uh, economics and, and regulatory environment, <clears throat> how the EU would adjust to a future with more and more, effectively more and more members, if this regionalism were to continue and you had these breakaways like in Scotland or in Spain. It seems it, it seems kind of in, in contrast to how would Scotland, which has been uh, trying to break away from London, then turn its willing would it be willing to give up its controls to Brussels? And ultimately, would the EU look at a, a, a many more member states, and what would it look like? How would the EU function given the pressures it's under now, under the 29 or so states? How would it function under many more regional members if that were to happen? Yeah, now, Luca, would you like to? Can't start with this since you didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, the the first uh, did, there are troubles in the, in the connection. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Simon, did you want to jump in while we will? <laughs> okay. So um, just to, to to restate the question, um, I guess sort of briefly. You know the thinking about sort of the I guess the role of, of regions. Yeah. Yeah. Within the and how the EU handle the, the the increasing numbers of regional bodies, and would they be considered more like the nation states of the past, which were able to um, I think to function more readily in a system like this? It's a it's a big topic I know, but I'm just trying to understand the future of the European Union and how it would deal with this sort of ongoing regionalism if in fact it takes place. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Sure. <clears throat> so, if anyone would like to, Sergi, go ahead. Yes. So basically, well, I think once again, this is a very important point. I think that um, the 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 challenges of the European Union in terms of governance um, are related to some extent um, 
to the number of players or the number of units or in this case the states that that build the institutional framework and that make you know unanimity rules and voting procedures more or less complicated uh, so from that perspective, of course, more regions within the European Union will increase the already very salient challenges of European Union governance and accountability and responsiveness and all of those things. But perhaps more important than that is what are the preferences of these new states, right? What, does, what is the disparity uh, in terms of like um, ideological, economic, political preferences? So I would suspect that the answer to this question depends a little bit on which region becomes, uh, you know, a state and, and how, you know, the level of difficulty or the level of challenge that this process would generate within the European Union depends a little bit on how well performing, you know, that economy is, which are the preferences in terms of like trade, in terms of like political institutions and so on and so forth. So, in other words, I could envision, you know, sometimes a bit more difficult to sort of bring together interests like in Poland, Hungary, France and Ireland, than perhaps, you know, if I could put it this way, um, sort of like Scotland, uh, Catalonia, Spain, France and Belgium. So it's going to depend on the type of economy, the, 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 the political and ideological structure of the new, of the new different uh, units. Having said that, sometimes these kind of questions, I'm not sure if this was, the, 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 this was in the background of the question, but sometimes there is this idea that, well, what happens if these couple of regions or three regions now become independent? There's gonna be a widespread domino effect and, and how, is this gonna, how is this gonna play out? No, this is a very reasonable concern and a very good sort of like question on the table. And I guess sometimes I think about it, and even if there's not a very clear answer to this, I think that there's no clear evidence of for the domino effect theory, right? So I think that the politicization and the saliency of territorial demands do not appear in the vacuum. Usually you have a bit of a center periphery conflict a bit in the background, brewing in history and, and sort of like, uh, 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 becoming more and more mature over decades and perhaps centuries. They become more or less salient depending, of, depending on the factors that we've been perhaps discussing, but it's not true that suddenly any random region will be happy to, entail, to, un, sort of to undertake the costs of secession. Um, so in other words, maybe even if the number of units, if we sort of like uh, go for a right of secession kind of like uh, policy, and even if secession was a bit more easy within the European Union, even if to some extent that would increase the number of veto players, the actual challenges uh, for European governance um, are a bit unclear. It will depend on how divergent the interests and the economies and the political functionalities of, the, of these new members are. And secondly, it is unclear that by resolving, you know, these secessionist conflicts in one way in Spain, in Italy, or in the United Kingdom, it is unclear that this is gonna translate or this is gonna just spill over or uh, contaminate other, poly other sort of like countries that are not experiencing at the mm -hmm. moment big center periphery conflicts. John yeah. Luca, you wanna jump in now? Sorry, I'm gonna... Thank you, I, I would add something. Uh, uh, unfortunately, as, a, as I, have, I have anticipated, uh, I have to leave uh, in, by 7.30 Italian time, so in 10 minutes. Um, um, the consequences of the unification of the European Union. Well, I, first I would uh, switch our role of political scientist or uh, uh, Considering the fact the former rules, and in order to be considered as a new state, uh, the supposed new state should be voted unanimously by all the European member states. So we can guess that the state who would lose part of his territory would probably veto this uh, decision. So no way to have new, at least peacefully, no way to have new states. Uh, 
And related to this formal aspect, I would consider that the, rais the raising of new uh, territorial <laughs> policies, new territorial uh, claims, and uh, advocating for more autonomy can be a big opportunity. And this was the, 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 the question of uh, your colleague there. The, an opportunity for the European Union. Why? Because that would allow the European Union governance and the European Union elite to answer to the claim of the, the demands, the inputs of the subnational uh, territories and the citizens of those states, those uh, self-defined states. Why? Because for decades, we, because it was the period of building the, the European Union, building the state, was a top-down process. Now they perceive, because the, the crisis of Europe uh, is almost, there was the, the risk of a collapse. Now the European Union elite probably understood better, not completely. I mean, Juncker is not kind of, <laughs> uh, but he can understand that we should go through a Europe of regions. So considering uh, the national state as a part of a federal uh, model, as a, in a sense, broadly speaking, as the United, United States. So the so-called, as Sergio Fabrini defined, as a compound democracy, compound democracy in which you have the role of the, the European governance and the role of the subnational uh, entities. In this sense, that would allow probably, I don't know if it's a wishful thinking, but would allow to answer to the uh, demands uh, of uh, uh, the regional uh, sphere and to keep in a legal uh, uh, background, in a legal framework, all those reivindications of uh, small parties, of uh, uh, nationalist parties. Finally, I would consider that we don't know yet uh, JJ, what the electoral performance are of those parties and what how they will uh, eventually behave once the national government. So there are risks, but there are also opportunities. And I thank you again, all uh, the, the organizations and JJ Spoon, and I do apologize if, if I will leave in a few minutes. Not a problem. Thank you, John Luca. Simon, do you want to add a few final comments as we are nearing the end? Yeah, sure. Okay, so my my view is that um, I think the EU could probably cope uh, with a new uh, member state, uh, and I think that it, when you're in a club of 27, if you add one or two more member states and you bring it to 29, it doesn't really change. I mean, this is a big club with lots of states. Uh, I think if you compare it to previous episodes of enlargement, we went from six to nine and then from uh, nine uh, to 12, 12 to 15 and on to 24. Adding a couple of uh, new states won't make much of a difference, in particular because Scotland and, and uh, Spain, uh, Catalonia rather, have been part of member states which have been in the EU for a long time. So they're, they're very close in, uh, let's say, the profile of their economies, the level of wealth, uh, diversification of their economy, uh, and as well as in their sort of public values uh, to the existing uh, member states of the European Union. Um, I think it, it's certainly much easier to uh, integrate new members from existing countries than it would be to integrate new members from those uh, countries which are uh, currently uh, applicants, for example, uh, let's say the, the case of Serbia, where which has got a great uh, degree of divergence. Um, so I think that in terms of decision making, I'm talking about everyday legislation in the European Parliament and in the Council of Ministers, I think that these kinds of 
uh, these new states would probably be incorporated into the legislative bargaining in a fairly quick fashion. I mean, it, it would just be, imagine including, a, I don't know, another Denmark or something. That, that's the equivalent. Um, I think what changes a bit, maybe, if you add uh, another player uh, with veto power, is when it comes to big uh, treaty reforms. Uh, so again, here is you add another veto point in the ratification process that may complicate the picture, but uh, as well as when it comes to the accession of of, uh, of new members, uh, which would have to be ratified by um, by by new member states, that that may complicate the picture a bit. But just by uh, just by my just by way of closing, since uh, I'm in conversation with the academics from the United States, I think it's helpful perhaps to think about this in parallel with the political development of the United States, where there was both this internal enlargement in the United States and external enlargement, so that you had states that were created from existing states. So the state of Kentucky created from the state of Virginia in 1792, uh, the state of New Hampshire created from the state of Vermont, uh, and then the state of West Virginia cre uh, created from uh, the existing state of Virginia. So you have processes of enla internal enlargement that took place within uh, the Confederation uh, of the United States. Uh, and they, these new states were integrated uh, into the US's uh, political institutions uh, and with relative ease. Uh, and the United States then continues to enlarge to, to its Western territories and now you know, it includes 50 states and that hasn't really prevented the United States from in a, in a functional fashion. Um, so I, I think that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about that particular uh, aspect uh, too much. Uh, but incidentally, uh, if uh, if there's anyone in 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 the room in the audience who who's an expert in uh, U.S. politics and especially uh, early uh, constitutional politics in the early days of the Confederation, then uh, I'd be happy to get uh, any kind of recommendation or, or reference with what might have happened and and how that uh, that experience may have may have uh, helped us to reason about what is going on in in Europe. Well, thank you. And we could, of course, continue this conversation for much longer, but um, I, uh, we, we will need to be uh, drawing to a close. Um, I wanted to thank um, Simon and Sergi and John Luca for um, very, a very interesting conversation and really interesting insights to, to, to what's happening. Obviously, we didn't even get close to scratching the surface of you know, what comes next. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that's a really interesting uh, future conversation. I would just say for those in the audience to be particularly paying attention to what happens in the Catalan, Catalan elections in the next couple of weeks um, and in the Italian elections in this, this spring in terms of what uh, that will look like for the, the Northern League um, that has now become, as Gianluca has told us, uh, more of a national party running in places that it had never run before. So this, co this conversation that we're having today is it will continue um, both in Spain and Italy and perhaps uh, in, in Scotland as well, where we may see a, a, another referendum in the, in the coming years. Um, but this is uh, clearly an issue that is very important and very salient um, as we talk about the European Union. And so this is, uh, I encourage everyone to uh, continue to follow uh, the developments and uh, look forward to continuing this conversation. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.